We've made it to Norseman and tee off at the world's longest golf course. Uh, there you go, the driver. Nailed it. Nailed the tree. Can we go now? Excitement levels couldn't be higher as we start our journey across the Nullarbor. We've left Lake Lafroy and our mining friends in Kalgoorlie to cross the air highway and the dry, hot, seemingly endless plain known to many weary travellers as the Nullarboring. John Eyre, the first European to stumble across this region, described it as a hideous anomaly, a blot on the face of nature, the sort of place one gets into bad dreams. <laughs> <laughs> but for those who know where to look, the Nullarbor is anything but dull. I think it's here, we're close. According to this, straight up ahead, it should be just at the end of this little section. I've heard that before. We're about to embark on one of the most visually spectacular, exciting and challenging science expeditions to be had. Hang on, what's that? I just see some rock. That thing, look! I can't even <laughs> see it. Oh. There, there, be there they are, there they are. This is the entrance to Wee Bubby Cave. What we're seeing here is a fraction of the beast inside. Look at this no, thing! No, 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 no. <laughs> that is something out of the wee bubby. Oh, that is just no, <laughs> It does go further. It's not exactly wee, is it? Yeah. And when you get to there, you're only halfway to the bottom. The rest of it is down a giant slope into a room. In fact, the Nullarbor is littered with gigantic underground caves and passages. That's because it's made up of the largest continuous block of limestone in the world. Formed when the whole plain was underwater, it built up over millions of years from the skeletons of tiny sea creatures. When the sea retreated, the limestone was exposed to the elements and cave formation began. Here it comes! Wee Bubby is the deepest cave in the Nullarbor. Lowering! plunging a hundred meters to intersect the major aquifer of the Eucla Basin. It's a mecca for cave divers, and today we're on a rare mission of discovery with sports scientist Dr. Peter Buzzacott, subterranean ecologist Dr. Stefan Eberhard, and Ian Lewis, a karst geomorphologist. So you drew this in 1972? 1972 was the first cave diving expedition here, and then I came back and did this vast map. This is what we did in those days, draw out maps like this. Forty years ago, Ian led the first scuba diving expedition under the Nullarbor, here at Wee Bubby. We discovered everything from here, all through to the hidden lake in here. Prior to this, only a handful of foolhardy adventurers had explored the dry caves of this region, locating telltale holes or dolines from the air. This is a carbide lamp that burns acetylene and cavers and the old explorers of Nullarbor used to use these. And I brought Fred's hat. He, he died recently, he was 95, but he had a great life and he was involved with exploring the dry cave here in the 1950s. So I brought it out here to celebrate Fred's life and 50 years caving here. Oh, beautiful. So this is what Fred would have looked like. Probably I look about his age, I think. Down we go. Doesn't look so bad. The walls of this doline are absolutely massive. And getting us and the gear down is a monumental task. Not for the faint-hearted or inexperienced. Even in a wetter climate, it's hard to fathom how these structures grew so large. If the water table's down there, I mean, how does it end up carving out this whole hole? Okay, this hole was not carved. This is broken by falling in. It's all jagged and it fell into the tunnel which is lower down that was dissolved by the water. So the chamber formed before the hole formed? Exactly. You can't have an entrance uh, without a chamber to start with. This is very Indiana Jones. This rung is broken. It drops from a sweltering 30 plus outside to a cool 18 degrees in the cave. Oh, 
Still, there's 200 metres of rubble to scramble over, with scuba tanks in the pitch black. So there's nothing easy about this adventure. Can't go to the loo in the rocks. I'm going to go down the water. With tiny headlamps, it's impossible to see more than a few metres in front. But throw a little light on the subject? You could literally fly a plane through here. It's huge. It's enormous. It's so enormous. <laughs> One of the mysteries is, is why is it so enormous? These massive big tunnels. How can we explain their size? I mean, it's supposed to be supposedly rainwater, isn't it? I mean, it must have been torrential. <laughs> yeah, and people think like you know, huge rivers must have flowed through here, but there is no evidence of that. Millions of years ago, when the Nullarbor uplifted, these layers of porous limestone fractured and weakened. As rainwater seeped through the limestone and gathered in the water table below, it opened up the fractures, dissolving them into chambers, which collapsed into giant caves like these. But Ian doesn't think that's the whole story. If it was just sitting there dissolving away very slowly, it couldn't account for the size and the, and the space. So we are beginning to wonder whether there are some other mechanisms that help the rock dissolve much faster. To get to the bottom of the mystery, Peter Buzzacott is searching for clues in the lake, 50 metres ahead, and another hour of schlepping our heavy gear. But it's worth it. Whoa! <laughs> wow. Oh, wow! I love the colour. That's incredible. That is beautiful. It's so blue. It's just beautiful and it curves out of sight way down that big tunnel, about twice the distance that you can see. Here, we get down to, say, 50 metres deep. So we get, a, we get a snapshot much further back in time as cave divers. And we're able to start to see from underwater what the water's doing to the limestone. This is my first cave dive ever, so I'm pretty spoilt, if not a little nervous. This is where you join a very exclusive club. <laughs> so very privileged to be doing this as my first cave dive. Ready? <laughs> well, you'll be seeing something there that so very few people will ever see. Water is so breathtakingly clear at Wee Bubby, it's like flying through another planet. We all say that because you can't see the water, it's invisible. We measure the visibility at 500 feet. I've never been in anywhere in the world that does that. This is the best, the best visibility in the world. It's ironic that visibility is the one thing real cave dwellers can't appreciate. What's that? It's a slater. That's just like the ones we'll find in the garden. See how they're completely white? Yep. They're cave slaters. Right. They're called troglobites. Troglobites? Not troglodytes. No. Which are people that live in caves. Yeah. But these are troglobites, which are animals that live in caves. So you're a troglodyte? And so are you. Right, yes. <laughs> and <laughs> I hope not forever. And these are troglobites. Yes. If you look closely, they've got long antennae and they don't really seem to be affected by our light. They've probably got no eyes. Right. You don't need eyes when you live in a cave and it's completely <laughs> dark. So that's an evolutionary adaptation to this environment. Every time we look, we find new species. So this is just wow. the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> Icebergs, not a bad word for it. Oh. I don't know if those are good noises or bad noises. Oh, man. That's quite wow. cold. It's very cold. It's fresh. Oh, it's very fresh. What temperature do you reckon it is in here? Uh, I'd guess I'd probably say about maybe 10 to 15. <laughs> no way. We measured the temperature in here. It's oh, like it? 17 or 18 degrees. All oh, right. You know that the temperature actually works out 
to be the same as the air temperature, and the same as the rock temperature, and the same as the yearly average temperature on the surface. Wow, so it all kind of averages out down here. It's very consistent. It is. Temperature is exactly what we're interested in down here. The water in these caves, in a big cave like this, you have a big lake, you have a big chamber, it should be the same temperature as the average air temperature outside because there's plenty of opportunity for heat exchange. Pete's temperature loggers show the lake is just over 18 degrees, as you'd expect. But in other caves on the Nullarbor, something strange is happening. The water is warmer. In a cave called Murrah L11, Pete made a startling discovery. It was 19 degrees, and everyone said, oh great, the water's warm, but I laid there at night thinking, why? So I started measuring the temperature to see where the warm water might come from. And I put my little temperature loggers through the cave and I found out that it was 19 and a half degrees over there. The further in he swam, the warmer it got. And I followed the temperature through the cave till finally 300 metres in, after a maze of passages left and right, I came across an area you could feel warm water coming out through this broken rubble on the floor. That was the most exciting thing. Exciting because if warmer water is pouring in at Murrah, it could be happening in caves all over the Nullarbor. Other caves nearby reach temperatures of up to 24 degrees Celsius. Suddenly it becomes interesting that there's this whole region of warm water which is unexplainable. Could Pete's discovery help solve the mystery of why these caves grew so large? If it's a 24 hours, seven days a week, 365,000 days per millennium flow of water coming into a cave, that enormous volume could not, I don't think, move through a cave without having some sort of formative effect. You know, when we were at the end, looking in, we were probably looking back five million years. Really? Something like that. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was such a good... I'm sorry, I can't mean to give you a yeah. hug. <laughs> that was such a good experience. Yeah, yeah. How <laughs> uh, the diver emerges. If I wasn't so cold, I'd go straight back in again. Pete's temperature data shows Wee Bubby Cave also gets warmer further in. But what does it all mean? Well, you're a cave formation expert. I was just wondering what you thought about Pete's hot spring discovery. Do you think that's an exciting thing? Well, I was a bit reluctant about the hot spring theory uh, until I had a good chat with him and so on. But I'm very interested in the area in caves where water temperatures are elevated. Why did you have reservations? because they aren't hot springs. They're not gushing out of the ground and we all jump in and have a lovely swim or whatever else. We've got warmer water coming slowly through the limestone as he's been able to measure it. And that's of great interest in a geological sense for caves developing. Why? Why, why is that interesting? That might mean that that water is coming from somewhere else or charged up in, mineral, in, in minerals and so on. And that has big implications for how big caves might form here. Ian's team has already shown how geothermal activity has shaped other caves in Australia. Giant sinkholes and caves in Mount Gambier, South Australia, line up with volcanoes in the area. Gases from the volcanoes around Mount Gambier has come up into the limestone and made the water much more acidic, and that explains why it's dissolved such huge spaces. But there's no volcanoes here. No, there's no volcanoes here, but you don't have to have volcanoes to generate heat or to generate changes in groundwater chemistry. The whole continent of Australia is floating on a magma. It doesn't form volcanoes, but it's able to warm and generate gases and so on that can work their way up through weaknesses in the rock 
up through it to the limestone and the groundwater and then you'll see the fire. Peter and Ian believe the elevated temperatures and structures of the Nullarbor Caves may indicate similar geothermal processes. It's a pretty new idea, but on the scale that we found it in Australia, in the Mount Gambier area, and the scale of the caves here, it starts to really open our eyes and say, this is a seriously new way to look at how large caves may form. A new theory on cave evolution may seem like enough for one day, but there's even more secrets to unlock down here. Stefan's taken me on a second dive to point out the extraordinary life forms that exist in these dark waters. These beautiful microbial mantles are made of bacteria, but nobody knows exactly what they live off. Their food source appears to be chemical rather than photosynthetic or carbon-based. In many ways, they're similar to like the deep sea bacterial colonies, the black smokers, but these are quite different, quite unique to the Nullarbor Plain. These microorganisms are already known, but Stefan's excited to find out what else lives here. I guess what I'm interested in is not the microorganisms so much, but the, the macroorganisms. We know that there are no large things, but the ones I'm looking for are smaller than the naked eye. So I've been taking some samples in here. Maybe we might have some microscopic crustacea, but I have to take it back to the laboratory and have a look under the microscope before we'll know. You can't see it here, see but Stefan did indeed make a successful catch. The first aquatic crustaceans ever to be discovered in a deep Nullarbor cave. There are brilliant chemists and geologists and whatnot out there who will never see the things that I see. And cave divers, I think, have an enormous potential to contribute to our understanding of our country. We're explorers at the frontier of where humans go. So uh, the more scientists we can get into cave diving, the better. Well, we get, what, 28 metres in that cabin? Something like that, and that's undisturbed. So and so I leave Ian, Peter and Stefan to delve deeper into the Nullarbor's history. It's time for me to hit the road and make tracks for the coast. Thank you.